Big man of faith. So uh, it's really important that you know this, that, that when we come together, the Bible says that we're equipped, right? Uh, in Ephesians, it tells us that he gave the gifts, you know, um, and every gift. But it, there's, and there's more than just the five-fold gifts. But one of the gifts is the gifts of a teacher. And, and he, he, this is a teacher more of, I would say, if there's one thing that I've known him for, even from his, his dad, faith is now, right? Faith. And, and so he's going to bring the word tonight. And so when the word comes, guess what? So will the, the anointing. When the word comes, the anointing. What does that mean? The bondage breaking. What you need comes. So let's receive from this dude tonight. Oh, here we go. <laughs> He's present. <clears throat> um, can you keep going for just a minute? So, I mean, we've been in church for 45 minutes, for 43 minutes tonight. And the amount of word that you just received was more than enough to just pack up and go home tonight, by far. What that was was a picture of somebody yielded to the anointing, which is exactly what Jesus did 24 seven. He was just a yielded person. What he did over here with this man, that's Jesus 101. And you have the exact same person living and dwelling on the inside of you right now. And so, so many times we're up against things and we, 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 we create this picture like Pastor Nate was just talking about where we're up against the wall and we're being the ones that's pushed back. But like he just said, there's something that's got to rise up on the inside of believers all over the United World and say, it's time to push back the darkness. And it's time for me to occupy the place that God's placed me in. And I'll tell you, when I was sitting down here tonight, in my heart, what I saw was a picture of suiting up for hockey game. Like I was excited to get into the stadium and play the game in a sense. Not that what we're doing here is a game, but God's putting people in position to use the gift that they have so that other lives can be changed. And how's he gonna do that? He's gonna do it through the hands of the people. And you need to know that what's happening here tonight is a good thing, but what's gonna happen out there is so much greater. Because God's got you where he's got you for a reason. There's people that you're touching. There's opportunities that are in your path on a daily basis and you're walking by them just like Peter was walking to that gate one day. That dude sat there for day after day, week after week, month after month, probably year after year and got his butt passed by by so many believers. But it took somebody hearing what God had to say to step up and say, I don't have what you're looking for, which is what this world has told you that you need, which is another $100 bill to fix your problem. That's not going to fix the problem. What's going to fix the problem is when I exert who's on the inside of me to them. That's what they're looking for. They need him. They don't need another me. They need me to be him. Yielded. I'm yours, God. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to give, wherever you want me to go, I'm yours. The people that impacted the world throughout this book made that decision. And I'll never forget being a young man at 16, 17 years old in the middle of a screwed up relationship and telling God, I'm done with this. I'm committing my way to you and I'm not looking back. And I didn't know what that even looked like. You know what? I, I was actually having this conversation with my son here just the other night because camp is coming up. And, and he is, is, is in the midst of a season right now. There, there's change happening. His best friend just moved to Minnesota. So he's having a hard time with that. But you know what? I was able to just kind of walk him through. Joni and I talked about our experiences of being at camp and experiencing God and seeing miracles happen. And I'll never forget being 10, 11, 12 years old, sitting in that place and hearing God call me to say, I'm going to put you on a platform and you're going to teach the word of God. And as a 12-year-old kid, that's kind of freaky to, to think about because the worst nightmare you ever had was when your teacher said, you have a book report that you got to get in front of the class and read it. But now God has taken 
the very thing that freaked the living daylights out of every person in this place, I would venture to say. And he's put me on a platform and he said, I've put my word in you, now speak it, use it, walk in it, declare it, be who I've called you to be. And there's something, God, that's so good about yielding over to what God wants to do. I love what Pastor Nate was just saying. Oh, I'll, I'll pray for you, brother. That doesn't help anybody. I, I, I shouldn't say it like that. Prayer does help people. But there's something that we've got to be willing to take it a step further if that's what God wants to do. And I'm telling you tonight, the message, what I've heard in my heart is something that was resonating within me for a long time. And I've gone back and forth through seasons of my life. And every now and then this will get brought back up to the surface. And that being this, reach. And I asked the Lord, how do we reach? And you want to know what he said? You preach. You reach. This is how we're going to reach the world. By preaching the good news of Jesus Christ that if you were lost, he found you. A long time ago, he sent out search and rescue before you were even here on this planet. Search and rescue was already sent out and, and a way was made for you to not be lost. A way was made for you to be well. A way was made for you to be provided for. A way was made, and the way was Jesus. He showed up to, to Mary and Lazarus at the tomb where they walked up to him and they said, well, if only you had been here. He looked him in the eye, and you know what Jesus said? He said, I am stand-up power. Talking about somebody who in that day and age, sitting in a tomb that's probably a hundred plus degrees, I'm sure his body wasn't looking so body-like. Probably a blob of slob in the tomb. But that didn't phase him because he knew he had an assignment. And we got to quit looking at what we see and judging by what we see and what we feel and what it looks like. And I'm telling, God, you're, you're reading my own mail, Pastor Nate, because I've done this a lot, where I identify with what I feel. And, and, and I'm not saying feelings are bad. God gave you feelings. And we should be able to identify what our feelings are saying. And we should be able to talk about those things. But there's a solution. And it's him. And it's time with him. And I'm telling you tonight, people, that we've got to get serious and working on what he's working on. And you'll find that anywhere that you go carrying this message, if you'll heed it in your heart and you'll live that life where in a sense you go to work every day, you clock in and you're at work, right? Picture it like that with your heavenly father. I'm clocking in. I'm on the clock with you, except I don't clock out. I just stay on the clock, whatever you want me to do. There's been several times in the last month that I've been up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, why am I up at four? I don't ever wake up at four o'clock in the morning. But you know what I do at those times? I just pray in the Holy Ghost. I don't know what he's got me doing. For all I know, he's got me praying for somebody over in Africa or something. Or maybe he's just got me praying for somebody here in Alma. But the thing is, is I've got to allow myself to be available to what the king needs me to do. Because <laughs> there's a job that needs to get done. And it's not going to get done by me just sitting on my hands and going, well, there's a lot of work to do. We got to do something. We got to be willing to extend a word to somebody. Lay our hands on somebody. I can tell you several occasions in the last few months where people at work, I've had opportunities to just pray with them concerning situations that they're going through. I've given them scripture basis. This is what God's word says. You don't have to deal with that anymore. God's got me in a secular workplace and that's where he's using me right now. And that's where I wanna be. I wanna be where he wants me to be, where he needs me to be because he's coach. And it doesn't do me any good if I'm Tom Brady and I'm the quarterback of the team, but I decide today I wanna be a wide receiver because they get all the attention. They get all the touchdowns. No, play your, play your position. Well, I heard in my heart, somebody's dealing with cancer. And I've heard it four or five times just sitting in here tonight. So I take authority over cancer. 
And I command you to dry up in the name of Jesus and be removed from her body. Out, completely removed, gone. Bye-bye, you're not welcome here anymore. Thank you, Lord. The gospel of Jesus Christ changed everything. I have a Band-Aid in my Bible. This is not what the gospel came to do. He didn't look at my position fallen in an eternal separation from him and go, well, I'll just get him something that can help him just cope with it. He healed me. He delivered me. He set me up on a, on a rock, a strong place. These are all things that you'll find in this book that a lot of people say is very boring and I don't feel like reading it. Are you kidding me? Have you spent any time at all looking through the pages of this book? Are you telling me that the one that created the universe is a boring person? Are you telling me that when we get to eternity, we're gonna walk into heaven and be like, what is there to even do in this place? Gee, I really gotta be here the rest of my life forever? Really, Jesus? Is that what we're gonna do? No! You're gonna walk into heaven and you're gonna meet family members that have been there for 4,000 years that you don't even know who they are because ancestry won't go back that far. <laughs> and you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna come and run and embrace you and say, you did it! You did what God told you to do. You got to be a part of the group, the end time people. I wish I could have been there, but I had to be up here watching you do it. I got a message to carry. It's the gospel. It sets people free. I've been in McDonald's parking lots. I've been in McDonald's drive-thrus, Wendy's drive-thrus. I've prayed with people in the drive-thru at 11 o'clock at night. I've been on the street corners of Minneapolis praying with people, seeing drunk people become sobered up in seconds with this gospel. I've laid my hands on people that were on in accident, skiing accidents and, and broke their back. Over the phone, somebody that didn't even, they weren't even a believer. I was sitting in a Perkins one night. Probably don't even know what that is. If you lived in Minnesota, you would. Perkins, I'm sitting there talking to three or four kids that were just in my cabin at summer camp. And I'm telling them about the good things that God has for them and the things that God wants to do in and through them. And one of them gets a phone call and he stands up and he's pacing back and forth while I'm sitting at this table and he's having this conversation and, and they're going back and forth and he, and, he, and he stops and he looks at me and he goes, well, I've, I've actually got a guy sitting right here. I, th I think he would be willing to pray for you. This is one of the kids that just came from camp. He looks at me, he goes, w would you pray for this guy? I was like, yeah, uh, sure. So I pray for the guy. I don't even know him. Never talked to him before in my life. He was in a skiing accident earlier that day, broke his back. Oh boy, time to put to test what I believe. Prayed for him. You wanna know what it looked like happened? Nothing. It looked like my prayer went unanswered. It looked like, God, what am I doing praying if you're not going to show up and open up heaven and blah? But God doesn't always do things the way you want him to do it. So what happens? I pray a very simple prayer. And you want to know the, the scripture that I used, I said, you know, the Bible actually talks about how he'll use signs for unbelievers. I said, do you know Jesus? He said, no. I said, well, I believe that Jesus can heal you. I said, if you get healed, then what? You gonna wanna know Jesus? He said, well, I'll probably want something to do with him, you know? I said, okay, I'm gonna pray for you. And I prayed for him and it felt so powerless and dry and empty. And 
I don't even know what I just accomplished there. And I'm going to my car that night and I've got so much condemnation weighing down on my head and a shoulder is just a difference. Like, oh yeah, that prayer meant nothing. That didn't do anything. He's obviously, he didn't get healed. All the things, you know, that I'm, these are the thoughts. Now I'm not sitting here talking and having the conversation. I'm just having an internal conversation, which is where we get in trouble a lot of times, but it's going on. And I got in my car and I shut my door and I said, you know what, Satan, I take authority over you. I say, shut up. I prayed for that man, Lord. I did what you told me to do, and that's all I can do. And I got I got my car and I drive home that night. The next day I went to work, I did my thing, went, you know, whatever, got home. I get a phone call from one of the guys that's sitting at the table. He goes, Did you hear what happened? I said, I got no idea what happened. He said, that guy that you prayed for last night, he said, they came in this morning, did an x-ray. He's not, he ain't got a broken back anymore. That's not because I'm a, a preacher. I'm a human being just like you. I got good days, bad days, hard days, all the days. But I'll tell you one thing, at a young age, I made a decision that this is important to me and I will let this guide my life. I'll let it guide my steps. I'll go wherever it tells me to go and I'll do whatever it tells me to do. And I'm not gonna sit here and say that I've checked every box and done everything perfect that God has asked me to do. But I will tell you this, if I miss it, I will repent and I will get right with God and I will step right back up to the plate and swing the bat again. So if that's you tonight, if you've been living in a state of I want to do what God wants me to do, then just take the step and do it. What's holding you back? Why are you slowing down? We ain't got time to slow down. Time is ticking away. You heard that song, DZ Tuck? No. <laughs> we got a job to do. My wife, she's got family in Iowa. They live on basically a square mile of land in Iowa. And when that corn comes up, it's this tall, you know, I mean, it's tall. Well, they don't go out there with their combines and, you know, run about 100 yards and go, well, we got a lot of corn. Pack it up for the night. They stay in the field. Just keep going. Whether it's dark, whether it's light, we're in the fields and we're going back and forth and we're going to get it all. Why? Because we planted it. Well, if we've planted it, let's go harvest it. What are we waiting for? We have the gift. We have the solution to the world's problems. Second Timothy chapter two, verse one, it says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. This is what we're called to be doing on a daily basis, teaching truth. I had a conversation just last week with a guy at my work. They actually told me they, they thought I was 25 years old. I said, I'm not 25. <laughs> they said, how old are you? I was like, I'm 37. What? No way. Yeah, I'm 37. Well, you look 25. Okay, I'll take it. Anyway, we're having the conversation and, you know, with young guys at, in, in, at work and, and mechanics and body work with cars and whatnot, there's always concern about ladies, right? So in, in my line of work, this is uh, in our world today, relationships are under attack in a major heavy duty way. Um, anyways, they're having this conversation and, and I began to just tell them, uh, they started talking about relationships and stuff. I said, yeah, I'm 35. I said, I've been married for 14 years. I said, and, and I'll just tell you this, I'm happily married. They said, what? No way. I was like, I wouldn't even consider leaving my wife. Not even a, no. 
No way, we don't believe you. You can't have a good relationship like that. I'm like, I, I can promise you right now you can have a relationship like that. They said, how do you do it? I said, you commit your way to God. I said, I can tell you right now that when you make a decision to follow him, he will make sure that your life is good. That's giving them the gospel. I don't need to have a Bible in my hand and be beating them over the head and burning the hair on their head to tell them they're gonna go rot in hell. I just need to be an example to them. Let them see my light shine. Jesus said, nobody lights a light to put it under a bushel. Let it, let it out. Put it as high as you can get it. There's a reason that our lights are on the ceiling because they light better up there. Lights further up there. He goes on into verse three in, in, in this chapter here. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life for they cannot, police, they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. You need to know tonight that you've been enlisted. And as a believer, I shouldn't be all tied up in the way that the world does things because I can't please God if I'm living, in the, if I'm living like the world is living. Like Jesus didn't, blend well with the world. He stood out. He was the guy that actually went up to the people that were by themselves and actually approached them. When everybody else was just passing them by, he was stopping and talking. He was just different. He let his light shine. And you can let your light shine. Amen? It says, uh, let's see here. And the athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. Hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all of these things. Always remember that Jesus Christ, the descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the gospel. This is the good news I preach. Because I preach this good news, I'm suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. So I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory to Christ Jesus, uh, in Christ Jesus, to those God has chosen. You jump over here to chapter three in verse one, it says, you should know this, Timothy, that in, in the last days, there will be very difficult times. Now we've heard this over and over and over and over and over again, that we are at the end. And I believe with all my heart that we are closer to the end than we'll ever be till tomorrow. We'll be closer tomorrow and right now. <laughs> <clears throat> For people will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and they will uh, love pleasure rather than God. And I was reading this tonight. I, I heard this right after this scripture that I just read you. Um, I'm going to read it one more time, and then I'm going to read it the way I heard the Lord say it to me. They will betray, friend, betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will need the gospel. Yeah, they will. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Because whether we believe it or not, every single one of us has been in this category right here. And we want to identify so many times as, I'm good. I got God, I'm good, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And so many times we're boasting, we're arrogant, we're prideful, we're, we're gossiping, we're slandering, we're loving the money we're making all the things. You know what I need? The gospel. The gospel changes everything. And the gospel is the very message of Jesus coming to the world to save me. You know, Pastor Nate actually hit on this and we're gonna read it in Romans chapter five. There's a lot here. You could literally just read right through chapter five and verse, you know, chapter six and just keep going. This is verse 12. It says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone 
for everyone sinned. I wasn't even alive yet and I was already in the category of a sinner. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. From, that, from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who, ha, who is yet to come. But there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. The result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads or leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life to everyone. Because one person disobeyed, uh, disobeyed God, many people became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. I wanna just talk to you in closing tonight about the power of a decision. So I was sitting here thinking, they say on average um, that the, the average human, they say, makes 35,000 decisions a day. <laughs> That's a lot of decisions. So when you figure that out, that's basically 245,000 decisions a week. When you take that into consideration and you break that down over a year, oh boy, sorry, hold on. You get 89,425,000 decisions a year. Now me being 37 years old, does anybody else ever have problems with your iPhone calculator? I'm, I'm getting to this, I promise. <clears throat> equals 472,675,000 decisions. There's only one decision that really matters. <laughs> one. Out of all these decisions as a 37-year-old person, that decision is, am I gonna receive what Jesus entrusted to me, which was the good news of the gospel. He told me in, in Mark chapter 16, we hear these things often taught. Mark 16, 15. Then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. <laughs> he said, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They'll be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They'll be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. The disciples went everywhere and preached. The Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. You need to know that when you're preaching, what you're really doing is you're reaching. So this definition of reach it down here in my notes. I wrote down, when I preach, I reach. 
the definition of reach is to extend, to stretch, followed, uh, followed by out and forth as to reach out and pull in. You need to know that when you're preaching the gospel, what you're doing is you're extending. Now, a lot of times what we're doing as believers is we're reaching in a sense. But my reach isn't really reaching you, (laughs) right? So what's gotta happen? For me to reach you, Chris. I gotta move. Can you reach me yet? He's still stuck in a state of despair. He's still hurt. He's still broke. He's still lost. Is it his job to move to me? Or is it my job as somebody who's been entrusted with a gift to move to him? It's my job to move to him, right? Because if I'm gonna sit here and say that I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I, I believe in what God has said, I believe in the, in, the, in the plans that he's instituted, then for me to say that and to remain in a state where I'm sitting on my hands, I must not really believe what I say I believe. But if I really believe what I say I believe, it's gonna move me to do what Jesus just said to do. And that, what is that? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach it, preach it. And you need to know that when you're preaching, you're reaching. Reach, baby. So Chris is in a, he's in that state. What do I gotta do? I gotta keep moving towards him. I, as a believer, gotta be, be, be willing to face the fear of encountering somebody in the world with what I have. And understanding that Chris isn't gonna pull out a fork and a knife and go, it's time to eat you. But this is what we do so many times is we're so paranoid of what is somebody going to think if I extend to reach. Now, Chris, we're we're getting there, right? So let's say I'm right here. I mean, I can hold him, but there's something that happens when I get closer and I start to really reach. And now I've got him. Come on, man. Come with me. I can move him. I can't move him if I'm not willing to get close to him. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to go jump in the pit with him and live in a sense, the life of sin that he might be living in. That's not what Jesus did. He pulled people out of that life and he put them on a new path. He offered solutions. And so you need to know, believers, that you are a walking extension. And I, 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 you know, you'll find that this is really easy. You just reach out. And I would venture to say, I want you to reach out and see if somebody will take your hand. Like, it's just a common thing. When, when you reach out, most people will reach back. It's not very often. Sorry, Mo, I'm not trying to pull you over the chairs. It's not very often that you'll reach out to somebody and they don't reach back. Now, you'll find that. <laughs> yeah, you, praise God, praise God. <clears throat> this is easy. The enemy has duped so many believers into, this is so hard. This is so, I don't know what I'm going to say. What am I going to do? You just reach out. There's something to be said about somebody that will meet you in your mess and say, hey, I'm here. How can I help you? You guys need groceries? Do you need a bill paid? Is there something that I can do? Is there something you need done around your house? How can I help you? But so many times we're content with need help. I've got it. This pit is horrible. I hate this life. I'm so depressed. I wish somebody would just do something. Hey, how can I help you? I'm good, man. I'm good. And you better be willing to face the reality of where you're really at and say, you know what? I'm, I'm in a dark place right now. I'm hurting. I need some help. I need help. I need wisdom. I need light. I need, I, need, I need you to give me something. Now, when you come out of that, let's move on. And let's say, you know what? Instead of just camping back out in my problem or going to the next problem and camping out in that, man, the gospel helped me get out of that mess that I'm in. 
What's the next thing? Where do you wanna take me, God? What do you wanna use these hands for? Where do you wanna take these feet? Something to be said about somebody committed to Jesus. Man, I'm looking at a lot of people tonight, decisions all over this place that are being made even in this moment. Like Pastor Nate said, I want it to be said of me, I found a man that'll do what I've told him to do and asked him to do. I want to be a man that's found faithful with what's been put in my hand. Do you? It's a decision. It's a decision. And it's a daily decision when you're following him. And I'll tell you, in our culture, it's not an easy thing because there are a lot of people that are all about intellectualism and what they can figure out with their pea brain. And I'm not about to base my foundation on something like that because I live in a world where when I look around, I see a lot of screwed up things. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that the thing that's in my heart, the foundation that I've lived my life on is solid. I'm not coming off that foundation because it's, it's saved me so many times. And I've come back to it many times and reminded myself of where I'm at on it. Understanding that it is the only foundation that cannot be shaken. Jesus Christ, amen. just make sure that he doesn't want me to say anything else here. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read this and then we're going to close. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. This is Paul talking again, and he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no division in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I'm a follower of, of Apollos. Or I follow Peter. I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? We've done this in our world right now. We have that church down the road, that church down the road, these believers. Uh, newsflash, there's gonna be Catholics in heaven. There's gonna be Baptists in heaven. There's gonna be Lutherans in heaven. <laughs> Anyone who calls on the name of Jesus is gonna be there. <laughs> Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? <laughs> Anybody see Nacho Libre in this place? I'm baptized. <laughs> the anointing just left. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, Lord, I promise. Okay. Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. <clears throat> For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. Verse 17, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. Not with clever speech, for fear that, that the cross of Christ would lose its power. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it's the very power of God. I know it is, because it saved me. And somebody that's all up in their head they don't know this because they haven't been saved yet. But when you encounter him, 
Something happens in here. The Bible says your heart becomes made brand new. Only God can do that. As the scriptures say, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligent, intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those God called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and the and God's weakness is stronger than the greatness than the greatest of human strength. When you actually look this up, this word foolishness means dull, stupid, moronic, lacking a grip on reality. So when this dull, stupid, moronic, lacking a grip of reality, plan of God is it's wiser than the wisest of human plans and God's weakness, this word weakness is actually, when you look it up, it means without strength, weak, living in a state of depletion. When God is at that point, he's still stronger than the greatest of human strength. I don't know about you, but that's the foundation that I wanna go with. You have a choice. God's not going to reach down, grab you by the ear, and make you follow him. It's a choice. And you're going to have to choose it today. You're going to have to choose it tomorrow. Or you're going to have to not choose it today, not choose it tomorrow. You can go without it. But you can only go so far. And you can't go anymore. So church, I just admonish you tonight. And I pray that you'll take what you've heard tonight from the scripture itself, the word of God, how we have been given the gospel, the good news that sets men free, the ability to reach into somebody's world and grab on to who they are and pull them out of where they're at. The gospel does that. But he does it through me and through people like you. I'm thankful to be a part of his plan. I'm thankful that he saw fit to entrust me with something like this and to place me where he's placed me. I just want to say yes to him. So it's 825. I'm going to let you guys get going. Before we do that, I just want to pray for you. And I want to let you know, if you want to know Jesus tonight, you don't know him, but you want to know him. Please do not leave this place without giving me an opportunity to pray with you, to receive him into your life. The gospel changes everything, amen? Father, I just lift up these people. I thank you that there is a remnant in this world that is seeking to follow you with all of their hearts. People that'll do what you call them to do. They'll go where you tell them to go. They'll say what you tell them to say. They'll do what you tell them to do, Father. I thank you that this is a yes church. I thank you that we have yes leaders. I thank you that we have bold and courageous leaders. And I thank you that people in this house are doing, actively doing what you've created us to do, Father. We're giving the gospel out. The free gift of salvation. It wasn't free for you. But we receive it, Father, by faith. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. You've been so good to us, Lord. We love you and we thank you that you empower us to live our lives for your glory this week. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.